Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about venous blood gases. So not arterial blood gases, venous blood gases. And I want to explain what venous blood gases are, how to read them, um, what they mean, and how they translate to arterial blood gases. So a venous blood gas is a sample that is obviously taken from the venous system, the veins. Uh, you can do this in a few different ways. So you can get a peripheral sample. You know, you often see this done from the arm. And this is, you know, more termed a veni puncture, right? Puncturing the veni, the vein. You can also do this from a central sample. And this is from like a central venous catheter, a central line. And then you actually can also do a mixed venous sample from a pulmonary artery catheter, which we're not gonna go into detail on pulmonary artery catheter. So these are the three main ways to sample the venous blood. And why would you want to do a venous blood gas or a VBG as they're more commonly referred to? Well, honestly, um, there's two different reasons. The first and primary reason is because we actually can convert the pH, the PCO2, and the bicarb from a VBG to an ABG. So a VBG can be a surrogate for ABGs in the pH, PCO2, and bicarb. Um, ABGs, right, are harder to get. You gotta poke the artery, it can be uncomfortable for patients, it can be harder to actually get the arterial blood. Um, so a VBG is a stand-in for an ABG for these three things, the pH, the PCO2, and the bicarb. The other reason is that actually the um, SVO2 on a VBG, which we're going to get into, is a, a marker, you know, a surrogate used for oxygen delivery and consumption, which we'll touch on, although not go into great detail on in this lecture. All right, so what does a venous blood gas actually measure? Let's do blue. So a venous blood gas measures a few different things. All right, it measures the PVO2, and this is the venous oxygen tension. Oxygen tension. All right, what is oxygen tension? Well, the oxygen tension is actually the amount of oxygen dissolved in the bloodstream. So this is the amount of oxygen dissolved floating around in the blood not attached to hemoglobin, but the actual dissolved oxygen in the blood, all right? It can also measure the carbon dioxide tension, or the PVCO2, right? And this is gonna be the venous CO2 tension. It measures the pH, right, which is the acidity of the blood. Oop, let me mute my computer. It measures the SVO2, which is the oxyhemoglobin saturation. Sorry about that. Oxyhemoglobin saturation. So this is the amount of oxygen actually attached to the hemoglobin, right? Not just the oxygen dissolved in the blood. And then it measures the HCO3, which is the serum bicarb, bicarbonate, bicarb. Oop, there's an R there. Concentration, which I tend to do with brackets for concentration. So with all this in mind, I think a, a question that if we haven't directly answered so far, we, we've indirectly touched on is why get a venous blood gas? And the reason is twofold. One is it's because venous blood gases can be converted to be reflective of an arterial blood gas and that arterial blood gas can give you information. So the pH, the acid-base relationship in the blood, a venous blood gas's pH is similar to an arterial blood gas's pH and we're gonna get into how exactly they're different and how to convert them. Same thing with the carbon dioxide levels. Um, if you're worried that someone is retaining carbon dioxide or you need to verify their carbon dioxide levels for their acid-base status, the venous blood gas carbon dioxide is reflective of the arterial blood gas carbon dioxide. And again, we're gonna get into how exactly those translate. The second different reason is, is that um, the SVO2, as we mentioned, can 
be a surrogate marker for oxygen delivery and consumption, which we will just very briefly touch on at the end, and it can be useful for determining shock states and resuscitation uh, for patients in shock. So those are kind of the two separate reasons. One is because venous blood gases, the pH, pCO2, and bicarb are reflective of an arterial blood gas, and those can tell us things about the acid base status and whether someone's retaining carbon dioxide or not. And then two is for this oxyhemoglobin saturation in the venous blood, which is a surrogate for uh, O2 delivery and consumption. So what does all this mean, right? For that, I want to kind of draw a picture that is going to be one that, you know, isn't uh, to form here. So this is going to be our stand-in picture for a blood vessel, right? So we have an artery, which goes into an arterial, right, which is a smaller caliber, which goes into a capillary, which goes into a venule, which goes into a vein. And for our purposes within the blood, right, we have blood cells, right, and these blood cells carry uh, our hemoglobin, that doesn't look that great, but that's hemoglobin. And our hemoglobin is going to be saturated with oxygen in the arteries, right? And then floating around in here, we actually have oxygen tension, right? These dissolved O2 molecules. We also have carbon dioxide tension, which will be green, these dissolved CO2 molecules. And all of this is flowing right towards the capillary. And the capillary has tissue right outside of it. And as these red blood cells go through the capillary, and as this dissolved oxygen and the dissolved carbon dioxide go through, things happen, right? So you get oxygen that flows out from both the hemoglobin as well as the uh, oxygen tension. And then these things keep flowing through. And on the other side, you have your red blood cells, right, that have their hemoglobin that now most likely have less oxygen attached to it because it gave some to the tissue in the capillary. And then you have your O2 tension, right? Your venous oxygen tension, which is gonna be less than your arterial oxygen tension, and your venous carbon dioxide, which tends to be about the same. So when talking about a VBG or an ABG, you actually structure it in a certain way. So it tends to be, you can write it like this on your paper, write the pH, then the PVCO2, then the PVO2, then the bicarb, then the SVO2. And that's how you can write it. So how do we convert an ABG, right? If we stuck a needle in this area and got a sample compared to a VBG, or if we stuck a needle in this area and got a sample. It's actually fairly simple, and it's one where a lot of times you don't even need to actively convert them, but there are some um, kind of data points to keep in mind. So converting a VBG to an ABG. Well, things to note is that your SVO2 can't be converted and your PVO2 can't be converted. So your oxygen tension and your oxyhemoglobin saturation, right? Because going through this capillary, oxygen comes off the hemoglobin and out of the blood. So the oxyhemoglobin saturation and the dissolved oxygen in a vein are much different than they are in an artery. So those two don't equate. But the city stays about the same, the carbon dioxide stays about the same, and the amount of bicarb stays about the same. But what is about the same? So for the pH, it's usually 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 
lower in the venous blood than the arterial blood. All right, for the bicarb, it's usually two to three milliequivalents higher in the veins than in the arteries. That makes sense, right? Because if your bicarb's higher, your pH, um, no, I should say, I'm sorry, that if your bicarb is higher, you would expect your pH to be higher, but it's lower. So that's something to keep in mind that those two things don't equate. And then your PCO2 is usually three to eight millimeters of mercury higher than your ABG. And this is the one where it makes sense, right? Because if your PCO2 is higher, your pH is often lower. So these are the big differences. With that being said though, studies have shown that there's significant variability. So some patients it'll line up perfectly, other patients it won't. And because of that, we have to be careful. So if your clinical picture does not fit the venous blood gas you're seeing, get an ABG to verify that they're either similar or not, right? So verify the similarity. Because if they're similar, then you know that you can go by venous blood gases. And if they're very different, then you know you can't act on that venous blood gas. The other caveat to this, so we'll put a star here, is that in patients that are super hypotensive or have extremes of acid base, extremes of acid base, there's been shown to be as much as a three time factor increase in variability between VBGs and ABGs. So they're much less, VBGs are much less accurate in terms of comparison to ABGs and those that are hypertensive or with extremes of acid base. Unfortunately, right, these patients, hypotensive patients in shock and extremes of acid base are often the patients that you need a blood gas on. So just be careful in these patient populations because your VBG might not actually be convertible to your ABG, all right? So usually you can use a VBG for pH, PCO2 in place of an ABG, although you have to understand that there is significant variability and if it doesn't add up, then get an ABG to verify that your VBG is comparable. In those that are hypotensive and shock or extremes of acid and base, it can be even more variable, so you have to be very careful. And again, it's usually worthwhile maybe getting one ABG and making sure it does add, uh, uh, does relate to your VBG before acting on the VBG in these types of situations. Okay, I do just want to touch on, and this will be kind of probably primarily another video, but I do just want to touch on SVO2 and what that means, right? So the SVO2, as we talked about, is the oxyhemoglobin saturation. Oxyhemoglobin saturation. So how much oxygen is on hemoglobin. And that's VO2 is a part of a VBG that is used, that is not just used to, you know, translate to an ABG. It's a part of the VBG that, you know, you actually need a VBG to get and not that, um, you know, for all these other measures, an ABG is always better, but for this, a VBG is actually what you're trying to get. So in the arteries, you have an arterial saturation of oxyhemoglobin that's usually 95 to 100%. So 95 to 100% of hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen in the arterial system. You then lose 20 to 40% of oxygen off your hemoglobin when it goes through the capillary, which leads an oxyhemoglobin saturation in the veins of 60 to 80%. This averages to about losing 25% in the capillaries and having 75% return to the lungs, right? Because that's where the veins are going. And this value, if taken centrally, right, off a central line, um, because you want to be sampling from that uh, superior vena cava, can be used as a surrogate to measure oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption, which can be useful in terms of managing and a diagnosing shock. 
So let me know if you guys are interested in us doing a video on that. Um, I think it's an interesting topic and one that is worthwhile discussing. Um, but I just wanted to mention that that marker, the SVO2 on a VBG, if taken centrally, peripherally you can't use it in this manner, right? Because there's too much variability depending on where you take that sample. It has to be taken centrally off a central line. Um, and that can be used as a surrogate for oxygen delivery, right? How much oxygen comes out here and then oxygen consumption, or I should say how much oxygen is here, and then oxygen consumption, how much comes out here, meaning how much is left can be a surrogate for that ratio of delivery to consumption. All right, well, thanks for checking out the video. Let us know what questions, thoughts, comments you have down below. Uh, feel free to hit subscribe and follow along. We've been doing a lot of COVID-19 content lately, but eventually we'll get back into a, a primarily non-COVID-19 uh, programming. So um, thanks for viewing. See you next time.